Amen. Amen. Morning, church, and welcome to Zion as we worship God on this first Sunday in May. So many Christmas. <laughs> We're going to worship God with our opening hymn, Come, let us all unite and sing, God is love. Number two, the voices and praise. free, set our hearts free, that we may come in this moment in your presence and focus on you, Lord, and worship you. Remind us of why we are here. Remind us, Lord, that it's only by your grace. 
Remind us, Lord, that you woke us up this morning in our right mind and you clothed us so that we could gather in your name. Remind us, Lord, so that as we sit in your presence, as we worship you today, it will be with hearts full of gratitude. And so we lift up our hearts, we lift up our voices, and we worship and we adore you, God, because you're worthy of our praise. You have been good to us. You have been good to our foreparents. You have been good to our families. In spite of all that we face, in spite of all that we have accomplished, in spite of all that we have suffered and lost, you are still good to us. For in the midst of the loss and the challenges, you have proven your hand to be steady. That we can count on you, we can rely upon you. And Lord, it hasn't always been easy because sometimes we grow weak and we grow weary and our faith gets dim and we lose our hold on you and we begin to sink like Peter in the water. But we thank God that you're a God who cares, who loves, who goes before us, who is always there with an outreach hand to lift us up. And we ask you, O oh God, in this moment of worship to lift us up into your presence, to experience that joy which only you can give, that we may worship you aright. Fill our hearts with gratitude. Fill our hearts with joy. Fill our hearts with your peace, a peace which comes from knowing that you are our God and we are your children. A peace which comes from knowing that if we confess our sins and our failures to you, you will forgive us and you will pardon us and you will cleanse us and receive us into your presence as if we've never sinned, justified by your grace. Because of the suffering and death of your son, Jesus Christ, we have this assurance. From St. John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. John 15, 9 to 17. We stand for the reading. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The Gospel of Christ. We sing the hymn in Voices and Praise 266, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. God moves in a
Let's pray. Lord, we know you're here with us. For you promised to be when we gather in your name. We know your Holy Spirit's presence is here. And you will bless the word of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts. You will make your will known to your people. And your grace and your presence will strengthen and enable us to so live that you may manifest your will in our lives. So bless your word to our hearts now, Lord, and glorify your name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> I would not be telling the truth if I say I'm not disappointed Anglet did what she did. <laughs> but God is still good. Amen. And whatever the plans are, I know God will still manifest his will. But this is a good testimony for the word today. And I know I'm okay, and the word is okay, because the choir song, faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. So I'm okay. And the world is okay. Question is, are you okay? Amen. You okay? Amen. Let's hear the word today. Has someone ever told you, be careful what you pray for? Yes. You heard that before? Yes. Yeah? Recently I was told that. And I had to seriously reflect and reconsider that statement. For we all have situations which develop in our lives that we wish were different. We wish were better. We pray to God for help, for guidance, for wisdom, for a way out, for a sign that things will get better. We pray earnestly. And sometimes we don't know how to pray. And so we find ourselves walking working and just repeating like a mantra lord have mercy lord have mercy lord have mercy lord only you can fix this only you lord know how to correct this lord i leave this in your hands in your own time be merciful and answer my prayer We have a saying I've heard in the other territories. Lord, make sure I get it right. Take the case and give me the pillow. Something like that. Or I will hold on to the pillow, you take the case. Is this bigger than me? Something to that effect. And the situation could be a family member, it could be personal health, it could be a relationship, need for a job, a job related. It may be an economic or financial problem that is now completely out of hand, mounting debt, loss of family support, loss of a loved one. Whatever the situation, it has become more than you can handle. And you resort to the one thing you always know to do, you pray. Yeah, You read the Bible for guidance. You listen to sermons and inspirational messages for encouragement and to build your faith. And you finally gather the courage to step out in faith, to believe, to put God to the test, to claim what you believe is yours in the name of Jesus. You speak words of positivity over your life. You develop a spirit of confidence. And you start quoting scriptures, affirming your faith. My God will make a way where there is no way. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. For nothing is impossible with God. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm not afraid. Because God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. For the Lord is my shepherd. 
and I shall not want. You take it to the God in prayer and you learn to leave it there. Been there? Yeah? And then you pray the prayer that you later tell yourself, I wish I hadn't prayed that prayer. Look what happened now. Things are far worse. I wasn't expecting this. Lord, this isn't funny anymore. I prayed and I asked for a solution and you give me 10 more problems. Hmm? I don't understand. I believed with all my heart. My faith was strong. I did not doubt. Why are things getting worse every day instead of better? <clears throat> then phrases like suffering might endure through the night, but joy comes in the morning. You start hearing those phrases ringing in your ears and some people around you as you share with them will tell you, it's darkest just before the dawn. All efforts trying to explain your misery. Does it help? God knows best. Anybody ever tell you that? When you lost something you love, you lost someone you love, they come and tell you, God knows best. Really? And God will not give us more than we can bear? Anybody ever tell you that? Do you ever say to somebody? But these phrases increasingly with the passing of each day begin to lose their meaning because you ask for something yellow and round and smooth and all you're getting is dark green, star-shaped and feels like a pineapple. Nothing you ask God for is manifesting in your life. Everything is completely different. It's even opposite to what you ask for. And now you are scared to pray. Ever been there? Mm -hmm. Because it ain't funny anymore. You pray for healing, instead death comes. Mm -hmm. You pray for a good job and all you get is slave work. Mm -hmm. And more death. Because you find out it costs you more to go to work than what you earn. You pray for your son or daughter and your child goes from bad to worse. Hmm? You drop on your knees in panic mode and you beat the bed. You cry out, why? Lord, you promised. You told me to trust you. But now I feel betrayed because this is not what I asked for. Ever been there? You are so burdened, you share it with someone you trust and you hear those words, be careful what you pray for. You ask for it. You tell God you need help, he helping you. And then the person turns to you and says to you, look at it this way. Maybe God has spared you from something worse. So be thankful. You prayed and you asked for this. You got that. It makes no sense. And then someone says to you, this is what you thought you needed. Thought you wanted. But God gave you what you needed for the moment. God has spared you from this. So be thankful. You can handle that. Look back at what you've been praying for and look at what you got. Does that make sense? Can you see what God has spared you from? And see how he has provided you with what you really need? If you can figure that out, then God bless you. You're safe. Hmm? Without telling you the details, I just told you my story. 
And I have been wrestling with this for some months now, months. And one day as I was meditating on all that has been happening and like a lightning bolt, it hit me. The more I reflected on this new revelation, the more I became convinced that the next time I preach, I must share this with you. And so we hear, here we are, Zion. You ready? And I'm going to present to you a truth which some of you might have already figured out for yourself. So it's nothing new. But I'm going to use some examples out of many in scripture to support this truth. And it is this. I'm going to try and sum it up in a few statements. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. God does not like math. Forgive me all those math professors in here. Or he chooses to ignore it most times. He doesn't seem to follow the simple logic of math, you know. A simple 2 plus 2 equals 4. But no, I got to get Pythagoras and sine and cosine and all these tangents and different equations to do something that simply requires 2 plus 2 equal. And then he tells you, no, it's not 4. It's 3.999996732. When God has a plan that he wishes to execute in the world and the process does not involve human input, then God executes that plan and it is known as wonders and signs, a miracle. Yeah? It's a miracle. You pray and you ask something, boom, it happens. A miracle. Yes. Does it always work that way? And this is the message. When God has a plan and it involves human input, the process most times goes horribly wrong. When God has a plan for your life, for the world, and it involves the input of human beings like you and I, the process often goes horribly wrong. It runs into chaos, and what should take two weeks takes a lifetime. You still with me? All because when God created us human beings, he gave to us something called free will. <clears throat> and that gift of free will, freedom of choice, very often interferes with God's plan for our lives. Not just yours, but he give your neighbor free will too. And he give your boss free will too. He give your friends and your family and your enemies and your cohorts free will too. And they have a way of getting involved in things that don't always concern them. Amen? Amen. Okay, stay with me. I am reminded of a practice we church folk have. We got a prayer concern. We bring it to church. The preacher invites you up to come. And you invite yourself to the altar and you present your prayer concern to God. And when you don't pray, you carefully take it back up and you carry it back to your seat. And then you walk out the church holding on your prayer concern as if it's the answer. What's the lesson? When you bring your concerns to God, leave them there. When you lay your burdens at the foot of the cross, leave them there. Amen? Amen? You see, we don't. And that's when the human side of us kicks in and derails God's plans. And instead of God being able to focus on bringing to pass what he envisioned for you, instead of God being able to answer your prayer, God has to spend all of his time fixing our mistakes. He has to spend all the time correcting the errors we made. 
and readjusting the route to get to where he wants to take us. Those of you who have driven vehicles with GPS, you enter your destination and then the voice tells you what road to take, right? Yeah? It tells you how long to drive down this road, for how far, how many miles, and as you approach the junction, it tells you, turn right at the next junction. In 100 meters, turn right. You don't know where the 100 meter line is. So you keep driving, yeah? And then the GPS voice says, you missed the turn. Hmm? Recalibrating. Hmm? Recalculating, okay. That's God when we humans are relied upon to help solve his problems. He's busy recalibrating, recalculating. How am I going to get this man from here to there? Which is my promise. How am I going to get this woman to this place that I have prepared for her? Back to the message. The three stories in the Bible that help reveal this truth to me. Three of many. And as I do it, you may realize there are many more. The creation, crucifixion, resurrection story is one story. God had a meeting with himself one day. And God said to himself, let us make man in our own image. And likeness. And boom. Man pops up. And out of the dust he came. And boom. A woman is standing next to him. He places us in the garden. And bam. Everything goes wrong. Because he gave us free will. Adam and Eve sin by disobeying God's will and command. God punishes them by kicking them out of the garden. Cain killed his brother Abel. Sin and darkness started to cover the earth. Filled with hatred and evil. Covering the earth. And God had to try to bring us back on track. Yeah? He sent prophets and we killed them. He sent a flood and wiped us out, saving just a family. Those who were spared learned nothing. And the world exploded into more chaos, wars, greed, envy, destruction, and lawlessness. And so God had come up with another plan, recalibrating. Another plan to save us, his people. And he decided he would come himself and redeem us. Yes, God said, the only way I'm going to save these people if I come and do it myself. He came in Jesus Christ. God's plan was simple. He would come, he would die, pay for our sins, and he'd rise again, and that's it. But it involved human players. Look what all Jesus had to go through. His own people, his closest friends, denied and betrayed him. His own people killed him. They got the king to seal him in a tomb, and God said, enough. Jesus walked out of the tomb on the third day. They couldn't accept that truth either. And so they made up all kinds of rumors and started spreading lies that his disciples stole the body. The creation story ended in the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. That was not supposed to be the way it would go. God intended to just create us and we'll all be happy on this planet. Didn't work out that way, did it? And then there's the Exodus story. God's people were facing terrible famine. And all would die if proper plans were not made. And so God came up with a plan. Someone from his people must go to Egypt and become prime minister and have the power to prepare, to prepare things and to put things in place to save his people. That was God's plan. Simple plan, isn't it? And God chose Joseph. How was Joseph going to get from his country village into the palace to be the prime minister? That was God's plan. You know what Joseph had to go through to get there? Hmm? He had to be hated by his brothers, so they would try to kill him. 
And then you will pick one brother and say, okay, we ain't gonna kill him, I just sell him. And they sold him. His own brother sold him to strangers. God had to go back now and recalibrate. <laughs> that wasn't my plan. But then again, I can fix that. He took those people and Joseph to where he wanted him to be. Where he could present the gifts that he had God had given him. And he would rise in prominence as a worker. He went, ended up in the palace where God wanted him to be. And when you think now the stage was set, Joseph is where God wanted to be in the palace. What happens next? The king wife messed with him. Joseph ends up where? In jail. It can't get any worse than that. My brother sold me. This woman lied on me and the king put me in jail. What is God's plan for my life? You're talking about a plan that gets derailed. And God had to be constantly recalibrating. So what does God do? God sends some other people to jail. <laughs> who are going to meet with Joseph. And who would be used of God to bring Joseph in front of the king. You see who God was? You see what all Joseph had to go through to get in front of the king? And you praying and you asking God for this, but you getting all of this stuff that ain't making no sense. It's not going where you want it to go. But hello, God is saying to you, sometimes you got to be sold by your family and your friends and betrayed. Sometimes you got to go to a foreign land where nobody knows or cares about you. And sometimes you're going to end up in jail for something you didn't do. So that I can put you where I want you to be. So you can meet the people I want you to meet. So you can end up in front of the king. You still with me? Yes. This ain't no easy message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This ain't no easy message. He ends up in front of the king. The king sees the promise and his brilliance makes him prime minister. God's plan is fulfilled. Amen? Amen. He saves his family, brings them to Egypt. What a miracle! He did it! That lasted for 30 years. And then these people ended up in slavery for 400 years. Lord, I never asked for that. Hey, You finally thought you have arrived and God has answered your prayer. And then the bottom falls open and you're in slavery for 400 years. You cry out to God 400 years later. God answers your prayer and he raises up someone named Moses. Stay with me. He raises up Moses and brought Moses from a river where he was supposed to die and put him in the palace before the king. God has a way of taking you from whatever that situation is and places you right where he wants you to be to do his will. Remember Jonah? Remember the story of Jonah. I ain't going through it. You know it. Hmm? For 30 years they lived in Egypt. They grew and they multiplied. Scared. <clears throat> Fair to death. He turned them into slaves for 400 years. Be careful what you pray for. All Joseph wanted was to help his family. Eh? And look what he did. But it doesn't stop there. God heard their cry. Moses came and he led the people out of Egypt to the promised land. Mission accomplished, yes? Mission accomplished? The people were rejoicing as they left Egypt. They were going to leave from Goshen and go to Canaan, maybe about three, five hundred miles. The pundits say it will take at most 30 days to get there by foot. 
Not to this. It would take the children of Israel to walk from Egypt to Canaan. 30 days. How long did they spend? How long? 40 years. God knows nothing about Pythagoras. The shortest route is a straight line. He don't like math. They spent 40 years going around in circles in the wilderness. 40 years. You know why? Because God said, the people in your life who messing you up, they don't deserve to enter the promised land with you. You don't see it now. You don't hear it. You don't understand it. You don't believe it. But some of them people who were in Egypt didn't deserve to enter the promised land. So God had to take his children through the wilderness for 40 years until they died. And then when the right people were in place, he entered the promised land 40 years later. Be careful what you pray for. You want promised land? Your grandchildren might get it, but not you. Hmm? So when these biblical stories played in my mind, I said, that's it. Don't expect when you pray and ask God to fix something that it will be smooth and simple. Like Jesus touching the blind man's eyes and making him able to see again, or the cripple or the leper, and they were made whole instantly. We have come to believe in an instant miracle-making flash of God. Truth is, God is omnipotent and he can say, let there be light. And in the chaos and darkness, immediately light appears. The sun, the moon, the stars. He said, let there be hills and valleys, trees and plants and the sea and the fish and the birds. And instantly they appear. God is all powerful. He can turn the impossible into possible. He can raise the dead back to life. But when it comes to a plan to fix your life and to fix my life, we've got to go through the valley of the shadow of death first. We've got to cross the Red Sea first. We've got to be hated and slaughtered first, not by strangers, but by our own family, by those who got our back. We've got to be undermined and sold as slaves first by those closest to us. And when God executes a plan to rescue us and redeem us and deliver us to freedom and success, we might have to spend 400 years in slavery first. And then when he sets us free, and we should be able to climb up the mountain in 30 days, it takes 40 years. And it makes no sense. But with God, there is no Easter without Good Friday. Did you hear that? You want Easter. But no Easter coming without Good Friday. You want glory. But no glory without the cross. You still with me? But why, Lord, why? You are powerful. Then as this truth broke into my consciousness in such clarity, God's spirit revealed to me that free will is the devil's playground. Free will is a gift that God gave to us, but it's the devil's playground. And whenever God makes a plan to heal us, to deliver us, to prosper us, to lift us up, the plan will require us to execute free will. And sometimes we are not the only players in this plan. And the devil will use anybody. Did I say anybody? Yes. The devil will use anybody to create and execute their own plans. And then God will allow those plans to fall into chaos. Throw you into a pit by your own brothers. Sell you to strangers by your own brothers. Throw you in a prison. Why? So that God can position you to be in the right place at the right time to meet the right people who he has placed there to take you into the presence of the king. Are you hearing me? Yes. You look back at your life and you see all the misery you've been through. You're praying morning, noon, and night. And all that is happening 
everything is problem after problem, chaos and more chaos. And you're losing your mind, you're losing your faith. And then God says, Lindsay, stop questioning my plan. Do as I say. For your ways are not my ways. And your thoughts are not my thoughts. You can only see as far as your nose in a straight line. Because it is the straightest and the shortest route. But that route has barriers and obstacles and snakes and all kind of things that you can't see. So you're complaining about the 40 years in the wilderness? Some you would have never make it to Canaan if you had gone in that street line. Are you still with me? Yes. You wanted that promotion. You wanted that success. You wanted that job. But God has spared you from misery. It's going to take you 40 years to get to Canaan. But when you get there, you're going to be okay. What I'm saying about sharp cut. <laughs> we want it quick and fast and short, and it is nice. Look at your cholesterol now. <laughs> You're too tired to go home and cook, so where you go? Then come in. <laughs> KFC, come in. <laughs> Fifty buckets of KFC, come in. But watch your cholesterol. You wanted it quick and sharp. Get to the point, Lord. No son, 40 years in the wilderness. But you're going to get your safe and sounds with your kidneys and your liver and your spleen intact. You can't see the obstacles that are in your way. But I see them and I'm sheltering you from them. Follow me. There's a cloud in the sky. Follow the cloud. But Lord, that's the wrong way. I know. But it will get you there. It will give you shelter from the sun in the day. And it will provide light for you in the night. So you keep walking. Follow me. Stop questioning my plans. I'm taking you to the promised land. But you've got to go through the valley of the shadow of death first. You will think you're going to die, but you must go through the wilderness and the desert. You will have to cross the rivers and the seas. And the more you walk with me, Lindsay, you're going to feel like you're not advancing to your goal or destiny. You're going to feel more and more lost. You will feel like you are losing more and more and the people and things you treasure may be destroyed and lost in the process. And Lindsay, you're going to doubt and question me. You're even going to lose hope and lose faith because of all the chaos and the misery you will have to go through to get from Goshen to Canaan. You will have to fight giants and hunger and thirst. You will be brought close to death. But know this one thing. Lindsay, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you when all your strength is gone and you're weak. I will help you and I will uphold you with my powerful right hand. There will be times when you look out and all you will see is the enemy rejoicing on the hills around you. As they laugh at your demise, son, when that happens, sing the song. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, for I want to see you. And that's what the prophet said to his servant. Son, you see the soldiers on the hill. You see the enemies surrounding us. Lord, open his eyes that he may see you. And God opened his eyes and he saw the angels of heaven protecting him and the prophet. And when you see me, son, remember this song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. 
And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Lindsay, your parents and your grandparents lived by faith. They walked by faith, not by sight. They were able to do this because they knew me. They experienced me. They witnessed my power and grace in their lives. And they did so despite all the odds. They never stopped believing. They never stopped trusting. They held on to my hand to the very end. And so, Lindsay, I know your heart's desire is to enter the promised land. And that is my commitment to you. You will get there, but it will not take 30 days. So when you feel lost and about to give up, just sing, precious Lord. Take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired. I am weak and I am worn through the storm. Oh, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. You see, when my way grows dread, precious Lord, linger near. When my light is almost gone, hear my cry, Lord, hear my call. Hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. It is no lie, Lindsay. It is dark as just before dawn. And there is no glory without a cross. And suffering and endure for the night. Yes, Lindsay, but joy comes in the morning. So hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. You see, weeping only lasts for the night. So hold on, my joy, for joy comes in the morning. The darkest hour means dawn is just in sight. And when the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone, by the river I stand, so guide my feet and hold my hand. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. And so today, I come and I share this message with you, hoping that I can stir up within you that faith that you need to live with hope, to live in hope. To believe that God will bring you, bring you through and to declare for you and for all whom you love, your tomorrow shall be greater than today. I say your tomorrow shall be better than today. When you affirm that, let you think you had everything under your control, eh? <laughs> Devil, you've been messing with me. But when you least expect, in the midst of your darkness, God is going to say, let there be light. When you least expect it, all you've got to do is hold on. Hold on. Trust God. Believe that he will keep his promise to you, that his promises are sure. My girl is queuing up a song now that we're going to sing. Are we going to sing this song by faith, believing that God will make our tomorrow greater than today? As soon as he can get it, you play it, my dear. Because Life is often not what it seems to be. The devil is real. And his main job in life is to frustrate you to lose your faith in God. That's his main purpose. And he will use anything and anybody to do that. <clears throat> and so, you can get it?
Huh? I don't know if it's all the music, so. Um,
stand with me, please, as we pray, as we affirm God's will for our lives today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for speaking to our hearts today and speaking to our situation. We ask, Lord God, that you give us the faith we need to believe, to trust you, to hold on, to know that you will make a path where there is none. And when we seem hopeless, Lord, and all hope is lost, may we feel your presence near us. And so we commit ourselves to you again. We commit our family, we commit our loved ones, we commit our circumstances, we commit our business, we commit our lives, Lord, to you. And we pray that in Jesus' mighty name, you will fulfill your plan. You will take us from Goshen to Canaan and give us the patience to believe and trust you. Hear our cries, Lord, and let our prayers come up to you. For we ask it in the name of Jesus and for his sake. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 I pray you receive that word today and you are blessed. Be prepared to share the sacrament of Holy Communion. Hearing from him, 422, voices in praise, as your family, Lord, see us here. The offering for the caring fund will be received. to the Lord our God. It is right and fitting so to do. It is a good and pleasant thing, joyful and salutary always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise, Lord God, ever living, ever blessed, almighty and all loving. Through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord, you created all things and made us in your image. And when we had fallen into sin, you gave him to be our Savior. He shared our human nature and lived a fully human life. He suffered rejection and condemnation and died on the cross. But you raised him from the dead and you exalted him to the glory of your right hand. 
where he reigns forever as priest and king. He makes intercession for us. In witness of his glory and honor, you poured out the Holy Spirit, building up many people into one body, making us living members of your holy church, and enabling us to stand before you to sing your praises and celebrate your mighty acts. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we join in the hymn of everlasting praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe. And blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread into his holy hands and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, Father, in obedience to his command, we do this in remembrance of him, praying that you will accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we who receive your gifts of bread and wine may share in the body and blood of Christ and become united with him. And so we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. We pray that you will bring us with our whole creation to your heavenly kingdom. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you, O Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory from all who dwell on earth and in heaven throughout the ages of ages. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Amen. And the cup of blessing which we bless is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Amen. Though we are many, we are one body, because we share the one Lord of the same drink. Lord, we come to your table, trusting in your mercy, and not in our goodness of we are not worthy to gather up the crowns and the table, but it is your nature always to have mercy, and on that we depend. So feed us with the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, that we may forever live in him and he in us. Amen. The table of the Lord is full. We are welcome to come and share. And the, bar, the bread which represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for us. And the cup, his blood shed for us. And feed on him in our hearts by faith and thanksgiving. Members of other churches present, please feel welcome. And share with us. Take and hold it, and we will share together.
body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for us, preserves us unto eternal life. Let us take and eat together and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for us preserves us unto eternal life. Let us take and drink together and be thankful. Amen. And so we pray together. We thank you, Lord that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all mankind. Amen. And the children, please come. Jesus loves the little children. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Let us pray. Lord, the children come before you again this morning seeking a blessing from your hand. It is your will to never turn them away. For you suffer them to come unto you and forbid them not for they belong to your kingdom. The children of your kingdom stand in your presence, Lord, seeking a blessing. We as a church join with them even now and lift them up before you, not just these here, but all of our children at home, wherever they are. We commend them to you, Lord God, and we ask that you will work out your plan in their lives. You'll give us the faith to believe that no matter where that plan takes them, Lord, you will bring them through to their Canaan land. And so, Lord, by faith, we commend our children to you. Pray your blessing. Pray you will guide their feet. You will take them by the hand and lead them. You will grant them the grace and the courage to lean on you and not on their own understanding. And that they will grow up to be the men and women that you desire and plan for them to be. Lord, hear our prayers as parents, as grandparents, as godparents. For the children of our community, the children of our homes, the children of our land. We ask it in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you. We want to thank you for being here today. And in spite of everything else, believe it or not, we are at the closing hymn. Ready to go? No? You can fix that too. But thank you for being here and sharing in worship all who have worked behind the scenes to make it possible, our technicians, our organists, our steward, and all of us, our readers, thank you for today. May the experience of worship sit with you every day this week with confidence and build your confidence in hope. Stand as we sing our closing hymn, I Don't Know About Tomorrow. It's 195 and Voices in Praise. I don't know about tomorrow, I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry over the future, for I know what Jesus said. Today, I'll walk beside him, for he knows what lies ahead. I don't know about tomorrow. 
in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A blessed day and week to everyone. Amen.